The poem that I'm going to give you is in German. Anybody here speak German? Not a one. Great. <laughs> Uh, and so I'm going to recite it in German, uh, but as I say, you all know it in English, but because it's in a language you don't know, all you can really do is sit back and listen to the music of it, and maybe that will be a, a new experience for this poem that you already know. The name of the poem is Der Jammerwoch, and it, the first line might give it away, Es brillisch war. Has anybody got it yet? Okay, let me give you the poem. You'll, you'll catch on soon enough. Uh, uh, well, I'll just tell you the uh, es brillisch war means twas brillig. Now you all have it. Es brillisch war, die schlichte Toven wirten und wimmelten in Waben, und alle mümsige Burgoven die Momenrat ausgraben. Bewahre doch vor Jammerwoch die Zähne, Knirschen, Krallen, Kretzen. Bewahre vor Jubjubvogel, vor frimiösen Bendesnetzchen. Er griff sein Wurpelschwertchen zu, er suchte lang das manchsam Ding. Dann, stehend unter dem tum baum er anzudenken fing. Als stand er tief in Andacht auf, des Jammerwochens Augenfeuer durch Tulgenwald mit Wiffe kam, ein Bürbel nun geheuer. Eins, zwei, eins, zwei, und durch und durch das Wurpelschwert zerschniffer schnuck. Da blieb es tot. Er, Kopf in Hand, geläumfisch zog zurück. Und schlugst du ja den Jammerwoch? Umarme mich, mein bürmsches Kind. O oh, Freudentag, o oh, Halluschlag, er kortelt frohgesinnt. Es brillisch war, die schlichte Toven wirten und wimmelten in Waben, und alle mümsige Burgoven die Momenrat ausgraben. She had spent the late afternoon with her only grandchild on the night she died. She still had her half glasses on as she retired to bed, resting her head on the pillow as if expecting to rise again. Get up, as she had always done, and prepare another meal of roasted potatoes, lamb, and a village salad. Tend once again to the family she had raised alone, a family held together by her pride and tenacity. But as her eyes closed to half mast. She knew her life's work was complete. She had seen her three children go to college and watched as each became established in well-respected professions. She anticipated her granddaughter's departure for college by summer's end. Over the years, her children visited daily, coming to her in shifts so she wouldn't be alone for long stretches of time. They wanted to buy her things, but she disdained flamboyant gifts and birthday presents and Mother's Day cards. She told them that the family was all that mattered to her. She was 74 and alone on this night, as alone as on the day she watched her husband leave for a new beginning overseas. She lived with in-laws that ruled her as she waited to hear from him. She rode out on a mule 10 years later from her village and started her own voyage across the ocean. She left behind her village costumes and cedar chest expecting to return home someday. She would never see her mother again nor her younger sister. She spent the years following and supporting her husband just as women in her family had done for generations. She buried her husband in the prime of her life she took on the role of creating a world for her children once their caretaker was gone. She weaved out a tapestry, spun the threads that gave each of them an opportunity to escape the poverty she had known. She retained her core as her children grew, as they reached for status and power and comfort. She embraced the dress that was her mother's and grandmother's as the children absorbed a new world with its own myths and rules. She continued to move among a small circle of friends and relatives. 
never becoming transformed by a culture that glorified materialism and freedom. She retained her identity and affection for an ancestral village that over the years turned into an irrational reverence. Her children would come to pine for the very centeredness their mother had always known, regretting their freakish lives as they straddled two worlds. On that day in late summer, when her oldest son found her still body, her glasses resting on the pillow, he called out to her for the final time. His plaintive wail was the only sound heard on this quiet afternoon. Her aged body had been stilled as she slept, bringing to an end her final years, years that had seen her become a bystander, a witness of what her family had become with her guidance. Resting peacefully in her bed, she appeared to be dreaming of a far-off place with fig trees and lemons and pomegranates and the aroma of fennel-flavored liqueur drifting upward toward the mountain peaks. She was back home in this dream, back to see her father and mother. She would no longer roam to worlds full of sadness and loss. We have warmed ourselves with wonderful words and song this morning on this very cold January morning. So I want one more time to bring you down to the rainforests of Ecuador where it is wild and green and warm and where I was a year ago today. And uh, I have a picture here for you of the Payon de Diablo which is the Devil's Cauldron and it's located near um, Banos, near the uh, Rio Verde. It is an Incan or an old ceremonial site, actually probably predating the Incans, from the heart of the world, the Vita del Mundo. So this morning, my poem is entitled Shaman's Call. The shamans are the medicine men who stand at the gateway between human and nature. Shaman's voice the forest calls, raining down upon us all the far-flung sound of nature's fall. At our feet, the invite sings, waiting for our minds to bring it to fruition. Among the tribes of people, waiting in their wisdom, teaching us their language, spirit guides to recognize, we hesitate and falter cannot conceive or alter our state of being deep implanted <clears throat> to receive an older knowledge in the arms of oneness in the spirit of the living things before we came to be. How we struggle to see and hear and connect to threads broken by long neglect. Deep in our spirits go, gaze at pools of knowledge known reach and listen, look and sense what is there beyond conscious consent, to places where still we go about with older wisdom shown within the gleaming point perceived when first the shaman's voice received. A forest calls and earth lays weight upon the frailness of this gate. Go to the places in your heart, where once you heard them speak and listened childlike in your sleep. Thank you for listening to my words. Mother's turning 90. What a gift to have her here. Although she's very limited, she still is very dear. She's mostly in the moment and content with very little. But no matter how many visitors, she still loves being right in the middle. Although a pretty new scarf delights her to no end. She only keeps it for a moment and then passes it to a friend. Her presence is a reminder. We only have this day. Enjoy what is and then let go with whatever comes our way. Thank you.
my first poem I'm titling Concealed by a Mist. There's a faraway gaze in your glistening eyes and an encroaching haze makes it so difficult to breathe, so difficult to witness you disappearing in grief. With your empty shell beckoning my heart, I feel a pull that you cannot receive. And though I sit by your side, you are lost, lost to me, not a glimmer of light penetrating the fog. So I chase the pull down the darkening cryptic abyss to lower a gossamer line from my chest, something to climb should the sorrow allow escape from the mist. But you are gone, too gone to reach for my ministering heart, which begs to know upon what hidden torments you dwell, as if I can't guess what lovers quarrel has made for your hell, only departing love silences so well. I grieve as you grieve, and you grieve and you grieve, yet I have to believe that you'll see through your man-made veil and ascend when you can on the ladder I dangle. It seemed that he kindled your life for a time, but in truth it is you who must keep your own light. Uh, my next poem I title Lucilius's Valentine for Modern Man. You purchased at the beauty parlor everything above the collar, hair extensions, fair complexion, eyebrow lift, collagen lips, whitened teeth. For a like amount, you could count on buying a new identity. And my last poem is Wrapped in Your Love, which is for Mark Stepakoff. Except there, where the pines scented the air and their needles softened my path, where the campfires crackled and lit up the faces of summer friends singing of deep woods and lakes, I didn't think of you much while growing up. Except when my grandmother, whose arms wrapped around me like feather, feather pillows draped in velvet, who always smelled faintly of chrysanthemums, and who rode in the back seat of the car with me, stroking my hair, died then I knew you were there because she couldn't be just gone. Except after a time she felt gone and life was hard and I didn't think of you much until my daughter, who rushed from my loins, drew breath and lay on my chest softly and warm and I wrapped my whole being around her and was sure you had to be there because she was there. More children than after a time I was crippled with pain and life was hard and I wasn't so sure. So I didn't think of you much, except when your son came and blew on my back, telling me I would be okay. Yet year after year I struggled, though less so with time, to be sure, but pain nonetheless, and I didn't know what to think. Except the man in my life, the husband by my side, whose kisses fill my nights, who fights with me but takes out the garbage anyway, who plods to work every day. This man who has wrapped his life around mine lays with me in a pillow top bed and I feel for yet a little longer and more closely that you must exist. Except I now do through the wisdom of time that the essence of you is beauty in rhyme. Thank you. If we believe that beauty's in Beholder's eyes to see. Behold, I grasp the beauty of what your life means to me. The beauty I'm referring to is not just ornate facade, but inner beauty built on love and gratitude to God. There's always more to beauty than what seems to me the eye. Your innocent sincerity in loving ways shows why. The inner beauty is built on truth, and that you cannot buy. Thus you, my dear, have both of these. Success is yours. Just try. For in you, our Lord God instilled the daring of the wild, and coupled that with love and faith in the gentleness of a child. You bring warmth where cold persists, a beacon in the night, an island in a sea of fear, a harbor of delight. 
What you should be is what you are, an angel and my dear, a deep and vibrant lover to whom I may adhere. Together, just the two of us, all others just the crowd, we'll show our love on life's grand stage and make each other proud. The others in the balcony will jump and clap and cheer as they see right before their eyes that love's what makes life dear. To steal a gaze in your green eyes will surely mean that I can catch the angel peering out, give thanks for you, and sigh. Expressive eyes transmit your love, all warmth with narrow touch. They're windows to the heart of you, the view I love so much. The playful exuberance of your style is mirrored in your laugh. I am most thankful and complete that you're my better half. Your talent as an artist, displayed in all your art, makes glad the eyes of everyone who perceives it from their heart. So it's you, my lovely Valentine, that makes life taste so sweet. It's everything that makes you you that makes life such a treat. Thank you. I'm going to read um, three very short poems. One of them is called Military Wives, and I just listened to one of those reports that you get on NPR every once in a while that are so poignant. Military wives weep in their showers before they brave, clear-eyed into the sunlight. They daydream of grief and a soldier's funeral, and the wife not yet them in black in the beating sun and the shock of a 21-gun salute. A tall mall drove pell-mell to mall hell for a pall mall. <laughs> and here's my uh, poem to my husband that he wasn't my husband at the time when I wrote it, and somehow it turned into something else. I said, well, you don't have red hair. And he goes, don't worry about that. <laughs> so, so I went on and finished it. It's called My Love is an Absurd Creature. If his irises can be compared to timid wintry skies, if his trousers at his feet reveal him fair as unbaked bread, if he's clad not but for thick lens that write his myopic eyes, if his hair's a wig ma maker's hell, of course, unruly red. If his smile's not a dashing, more a charming, foolish grin, remindful of a game sheep dog with a bonny bone to bury. Then you have met my love, who gently teases. This specimen requests, my dear, that you describe me as her suit, not Harry. And others cry, go look elsewhere and find you a love more pretty. I've seen their perfect uh, Englishmen with their horses and their hounds. My love has left them coughing dust, for he prefers to drive me with a steady hand, whispering praise and fearsome, passionate frowns. And though there are times I see indeed he is an absurd creature. One's love should above all love one. My love is most handsome feature. Thank you. Laundry, gathering all funky smell of dirty, musty, stained stuff, throw and submerge them in white frosty salt rubbing and spinning to lift and to free all the unpleasant, unwanted odor and mark to dispel in white salt that walling down, splash cold crystal clear water to rinse and to wash out, still lingering and clinging uninvited, 
unwanted smell and stain, hurtful labels and stigma for what I was, what I was not, what I am, what I am not. Laundry, laundry, wash day, light in a washing machine, lower and stream, or bubbly broke, but on my feet. Tapping, stumping, step, dabbing, kisses on earth with my feet, circling around, feeling my hair and face brushed by wind. Wind, wind, blow, blow hard until I feel free of all self doubt, shake and shed off these crushed mud and dirt, demeaning thorny levels and stigma that stick on my skin and bone, stop me from growing. Bearing raindrops, piss on my skin. Rain, rain, drizzle drop, whip. Hide and wash my tears, soak deep into skin and vein. Clean and fresh me inside out. Quench my longing, plumb my wrinkled, withering heart to supple and open to taste fresh water and peace. Sensing rising sun, rolled up the starlight sky lifting my eyelid, calling me on foot. Sun, sun, shine and shine, dissect, left, broken, bruised, shivering body to life. I was told a thousand times, shy away your scorching, bright, blazing light, which my blind sight plant specks of mold on my skin. But when your light feels so warm and shooting, all those rushy green flowers and meadows drive and flourish in your life. Why do I need to learn and hide away? Once young and naive, not trusting my senses and heart, eager to please others, followed others' dictations and expectations. Many faces, many comments weighted me down with fears and confusion. Each steers, pulls, entices, terrorizes, crushes, and crumbled me into fragmented lump, easy to mold their programs and exp explorations. Draining out any hope, living only faintly, flickering light of life to sustain and to carry their wishes. I do not believe anymore all what others say. I'm not afraid. I just woke up and fell off. I see bumpy express a train to my grave. I have no place to learn, nothing to lose. Sun, sun, dazzling sun, shine and shine, deceived, wrecked broken, bruised, shivering body, head to toe, keep me warm, melt, and my icy frozen, shattered heart, free from all jabs and stabs. Light deep, every fiber and cell, plumb energy, encourage me to be self, ever-growing, renewing self with each breath, to strive for better pleasure, yet strong and persistent, as a tiny green grass a finger that cut through cold, icy snow-covered soil. Dry and chase out all shadow and darkness, drenched worries and creeping, crippling body thought from my mind and heart. Lift to spirit, bright and shine as you write, warm, soft to and fluffy to plant seeds of hope, love. Laundry, laundry, wash day on my feet. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org. <laughs> 